It is preparing, setting up the meeting, redirecting, Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Christina Lee Brown Envirome Institute's Science Communication Office Hour. I'm Lauren Anderson, a research manager for the Center for Healthy Air, Water, and Soil in the Envirome Institute at the University of Louisville. We are an integrated group of physicians, scientists, engineers, epidemiologists, economists, psychologists, statisticians, sociologists, and community members working to turn scientific discovery into actionable knowledge. Researchers within the Envirome Institute study how conditions of the human environment promote health or drive disease. We host monthly science communication office hours that are streamed live on Facebook to have the opportunity to share and hear directly from the wider community. So please engage with us by posting comments on this video. To engage further, please visit our website, enviroinstitute.org, Facebook, where we are now, and Twitter using the hashtag, this is Enviro. The last time we gathered, Dr. Alok Amratkar shared about the NEAT clinical trial to see whether taking a dietary supplement of carnosine can help against certain types of air pollution. We are actively recruiting for this study now. Participation involves four study visits, which include health surveys and health measures like blood pressure, urine, and blood samples. Participants receive $25, $50, and $75 visa gift cards for their first for their first and fourth visits. Appointments are going to be scheduled in February of 2022 and onward. If you are interested, please visit the pre-screener webpage. That's neatstudyky.com or contact Julie Caswell at 502-587-4177. I'm so excited because this week we have exciting developments to discuss. Our special guest today is Dr. Lincoln Larson, who will be sharing about his work on greening and his partnership with the Green Heart Project. After Dr. Larson, we'll receive an update on COVID-19 and Omicron here in Louisville. But before we get to that, let me allow our communication team to introduce themselves. I'm joined today by my colleagues and fellow Environment Institute researchers, Dr. Jason Hellman and Dr. Natasha Dejarnet. Would you all like to introduce yourselves, please? Go ahead, Natasha. So I am Dr. Natasha Dejarnet. I am an assistant professor um, here in the Christina Lee Brown Environment Institute, and my research interests are around climate and health, <clears throat> excuse me, as well as environmental health disparities. And I'm Dr. Jason Elman. I'm also an assistant professor in the Environment Institute. Uh, my laboratory focuses on understanding the role of specialized pro-resolving lipid mediators and how they affect uh, inflammatory uh, magnitude and duration in the context of diabetes and obesity. Excellent, thank you. And with that, I will go and introduce our speaker today, Dr. Lincoln Larson. Dr. Lincoln Larson is an associate professor of, in the Department of Parks, Recreation and Tourism Management at NC State University. His work focuses on promoting positive interactions between humans and nature with a particular emphasis on environmental justice. We look forward to hearing from you today, Dr. Larson, you have the floor. Thanks for having me and thanks for that, uh, that great intro. I'm just gonna start sharing slides here. Uh, and as I do, I want to acknowledge for everyone that I am not a health researcher. <laughs> as Natasha said, I'm a park researcher. I study natural resource issues, but I'm really interested in the health outcomes associated with nature. And so that's what we're gonna talk about today. Just wanna confirm that you all are looking at just a single slide here. Is that good? Got it. All right, excellent. Um, the angle, I wanna talk about is this, the social justice implications of the greening and tree planting efforts linked to the Green Heart Project in Louisville. And so what I'm talking about is a collaboration involving lots of universities, agencies, and NGO partners, some of them listed here, uh, as we kind of pursue these questions about social justice in this urban greening space. And this is an ongoing study. So some of the results I'll share today are just prelim preliminary 
uh, kind of tip of the iceberg stuff, uh, but hopefully it'll give you a sense of where we're headed and some of the lessons that we've learned so far. Uh, those of you tuning in are probably familiar with the Greenheart Project and Greenheart Louisville. So I'm not gonna go into great detail there. Clearly, you know, this is uh, an effort outcomes via urban greening or tree planting uh, to see how, just how, what capacity uh, that these trees uh, can produce in terms of health outcomes on the landscape. But green heart and models like green heart only work if there are trees on the landscape and if we can plant more of them, if we're going to increase greening efforts. And that is often easier said than done. A lot of tree planting NGOs and tree planting organizations are, that are out there really work on public lands and public right of ways and places that are easier to access. But if you really want to make a dent in the urban tree canopy, if you really want to increase it, you have to be able to get green coverage on private lands. And that is a monumental challenge in many places. And the Greenheart team is very familiar with this challenge because they've faced it repeatedly uh, over the course of the last few years. Tree planting programs in diverse communities often meet resistance uh, and that impacts their success. And just to give you an example of this, here are some headlines and articles over the last uh, few years and look, looking at you know, what we think is an obvious solution, planting trees and how it's met by local communities who may perceive it as something very different than what we see. And so thinking about the potential pitfalls of greening in addition to the benefits, it's something that our research is really focused on. And how do we merge these two and overcome some of these challenges? Those are the types of questions that our research team is interested in pursuing. There are two sides of trees. From the green heart side, from the natural resource side, we usually think about the good stuff. And this is what we like to promote, better health outcomes, certainly linked to green heart, shade, better park spaces, this concept of ecosystem services, which you may be familiar with, the benefits that nature provides to people, green infrastructure, community pride, uh, and a lot of the, the parks that we see and love. But there is a dark side, if you will, uh, to trees as well. And this is what a lot of people see. You know, they may hear us saying, touting the benefits of trees, saying all these things. But a lot of people, when they think of trees, especially on their land, they think of maintenance costs. They think of all the leaves are going to have to rake, rake in the fall. They think of sidewalk and sewer problems, potential hazards if a tree limb was to fall. They might think of crime and safety concerns. So to a lot of people, trees are a problem. They're a nuisance. And there's something to be worried about, not necessarily something to embrace. So how do we better understand this narrative? And what do we do if urban greening for health outcomes or anything else is one of our goals? And so this is where our project comes in. It's supported by the US Forest Service and their National Urban and Community Forestry Advisory Council. And what we wanna do in this project is to understand the social and the cultural factors that influence the success of urban greening interventions with the goal of ultimately identifying environmentally just practices to guide greening efforts in diverse communities. And as I mentioned before, there are lots of partners involved in this. Uh, we have colleagues at University of Oklahoma, Texas A&M that are working on this among other institutions. And there are lots of ways to go about answering a question this complex, both locally in a place like Louisville or on a national scale. And I don't wanna get into great detail about everything that we're doing to understand this phenomenon in more detail. But to give you some hint, I've added some of our aims and methods up here. We're thinking about uh, reading what's been written about this topic in various places, surveying local residents in, in Louisville and community leaders to know what they think, doing focus groups with national organizations, whether it's federal and state agencies, whether it's NGOs and municipal arborists, uh, lots of different groups are involved and clearly have important insights related to this. But what we want to ultimately do through all these methods is to identify strategies for promoting urban greening with communities, not just within or to communities. And I think in a lot of cases, that's where urban greening efforts struggle if it tends to be more outside coming in or top down rather than providing a community voice in the process. So what I want to do for the next couple of minutes is to take you through 
some of the results do we have so far from a few components of this research and any with some close in with some closing thoughts and recommendations about where we might go from here to make all this tree planting all this urban greening a little more socially just and sustainable one of the things that we started with in this project was a door-to-door -door survey of louisville residents in greenheart neighborhoods uh, we work with Louisville Grows, a tree planting NGO in the city, which is a phenomenal partner, uh, continue to be a phenomenal partner. And they knocked, their team knocked on almost 5,000 doors and talked about 1,000 people. Of those people, about 42% accepted a tree uh, as they were canvassing and asked, hey, do you want a tree on your property? And we got some surveys from, from those folks. And the remainder declined a tree or rejected a tree saying, no, we don't want it at this time. And people had their reasons for either taking one or leaving one given the choice. And so one of the initial things we wanted to look at on, on this survey was, why'd you take it or why didn't you? And you might be able to predict some of the reasons that people accepted trees. These were the most common ones with aesthetic value and beautification of their property being number one. They were really interested in improved air quality I don't know if that's the norm nationally. Maybe Greenheart has just done a good job of publicizing those benefits, uh, generating shade and cooling, wildlife habitat, property value came up a number of times, recreation opportunities, and other reasons such as privacy uh, and just simply loving trees are, are things that were mentioned as well in terms of why people want them. Why didn't people want trees? Why did they decline trees? Uh, those reasons were uh, much more variable. The biggest one was maintenance issues that about a third of the people specifically mentioned in that open-ended question. Uh, some of them didn't have uh, decision-making authority regarding their property. Some people just didn't like trees or were worried about some of the other nuisances they might provide. And some people just said, we have too many trees already, we don't need any more which would be great uh, if it were true from a canopy coverage standpoint, <laughs> but we know from spatial data that that's not necessarily the case. So again, it's kind of these cultural barriers uh, to tree acceptance and understanding what the community is willing to, to, uh, to handle it is something that's very prominent here. So that's just a snippet of the on the ground stuff. We've also talked in more detail to some of these tree recipients to figure out what they think about links between trees and health outcomes and how that might change their perceptions of their neighborhoods and their communities. And those are data that we're gonna dive into um, as our project progresses. Just wanna briefly share some of the results we have from the national study uh, focused on equitable greening practices. And this was done through a series of surveys with urban forestry and greening nonprofits and other organizations like some of the agencies I mentioned, environmental justice groups and a few others. And we also had a focus group component where we talked to a subset of these folks in far more detail to get a better sense of what they're doing that's working and what the challenges they face on the ground might be. So running through a few of the key results there that might be of interest to this audience. First and foremost was identifying tree planting priorities. So when you ask these organizations, where do you prioritize or what do you prioritize when you're planting trees? The thing that came up most often was increasing tree canopy coverage. And that was independent of any socioeconomic factors on the landscape. So often people look at maps, where are there gaps in trees? This is where they need to go. But when you're dealing with a system that also has strong social and cultural components in a lot of these cities, that's just one small piece of the much larger puzzle. Fortunately, there are a lot of organizations that do plant with social equity in mind, and there are tools to help them do that, such as American Forest tree equity score analyzer. And there's a, a clip of the Louisville area pictured here that helps you figure out where is there a high degree of tree equity and where are trees most needed on the landscape, uh, considering those socioeconomic factors. A lot of organizations plant for hazard mitigation purposes, often stormwater management, but sometimes to, to deal with urban heat island effects or air pollution. Some explicitly plant for ecosystem services provision and others, such as Greenheart, are directly targeting health outcomes in some of their planting initiatives. So those are the reasons why a lot of organizations plant trees and engage in greening. What about their community engagement strategies? And this is where, when you ask questions like this, especially in focus groups, 
you get a big sigh <laughs> very often because it is a struggle around these issues for a lot of these NGOs who've been doing this a long time. And that's because one of the most important elements for all of us that do community engagement work, no, building trust is so critical and it takes a lot of time. And that can be a real challenge uh, if you're operating in lots of different types of urban neighborhoods, not always on a consistent basis. And to do that, you might need to do things like attend community events and visit public places. And that came up a lot in our conversations. And a place like Louisville, working with neighborhood associations is really important. And that's a group that we'll start surveying uh, and, and speaking with in Louisville next month, actually, as part of our project. Uh, stakeholder meetings that are one-on-one, door-to-door canvassing. I mentioned some of those efforts earlier. Social media has become important. Telling stories rather than just presenting data is really important too. Uh, as is visibility of, of successes to date. And one of the big things that kept coming up that the NGOs in particular struggle with is figuring out who is not being reached. Because a lot of groups are very good at going back to their familiar faces and, and usual customers uh, and, and stakeholders to say, hey, you want more trees, you want this and that. But forging those relationships with new populations, which is absolutely essential if the goal is equitable greening, is far more difficult. And you have to be intentional and very proactive about doing uh, some of that in order for these strategies to work. On the equity side of things, what are we finding in terms of supporting equity? Uh, these are some of the recommendations that the organizations we've been talking to and working with have, have indicated work on a longer time frame. And these are mistakes often made in tree planting efforts. Don't plant and walk away. Very often these efforts, you generate a lot of money, you have financial support to plant a ton of trees in X amount of time. And once they're in the ground, organizations cross their fingers and say, let's hope they survive. And they may never know if they survive. There's often not an effort to go back and check. And so you need to factor in the long-term care of this tree and support for the resident or uh, whoever's in the local area that's going to be caring for the tree too. Uh, they may not have the skills or the resources to do that effectively. So you got to keep following up. And that's really important is that consistent communication and support that's often lacking. Give people choices. <laughs> uh, you know, don't say, this is the tree you're going to get. Where do you want me to put it? Talk to them about what they're looking for. We just saw a list of all the different reasons people may or may not want trees. And if they want a beautiful uh, addition to their yard, planting an evergreen or a pine tree might not be it. You know, it's, it's not gonna see the flowers in the spring or any element of that. And so these are things that are really important to consider, not just necessarily uh, the capacity of a tree to filter air quality or anything like that, but what the resident actually wants to see on their, their property. Hiring within communities to accomplish some of these goals is really important as well to diversify representation and have a community presence in that planning and decision-making process, that helps with the sustainability of projects uh, and making sure a lot of these efforts are uh, accepted initially and then last over the long-term. Citizen advisory boards can fill similar roles and partnerships are key in, in any of this kind of work. And Greenheart has done a really good job, obviously, of building a diverse set of, of partners in order to make this possible, whether it's NGOs, corporations, governments, uh, and this is really important in whatever urban context people are working in. And it's often hard to get sustained support to convince the city to view trees as an equity and health promoting asset. And when I say the city here, I mean both city government and you know, key decision makers at the high levels, but also the communities where the trees are actually going uh, to understand not just you know, the dark side of trees that they often see, as I indicated earlier, but also all those benefits that we try to promote and we know about, uh, but are sometimes harder to recognize and less evident for a variety of reasons. Uh, so that's uh, an overview of kind of what we, where we have so far and where we're going with a lot of this stuff. Um, I just want to point out that, you know, I'm talking about this in the context of urban tree planting, but you can think about these social justice issues in urban spaces on a much broader scale. And a lot of the same lessons apply. Uh, you need to be reflective. You need to be intentional. You need to be proactive to foster just urban greening efforts. And you can't just think about your organization, your perspectives, you have to get a sense of what the community thinks and feels about a lot of these issues as well.
Uh, so with that, I'll put my contact information up there. A picture of the Louisville Gross team in full Lorax costume there for you, for you to enjoy uh, and acknowledge some of our partners again in this work, which is ongoing and we're really excited about. Uh, so at that point, I'll just st stop and pause and see if anybody on the call today or, or uh, in advance has any questions about some of what we found so far. Thank you, Larson. That was uh, really exciting, really thorough. Um, I was just curious, you kind of touched upon it a little bit, but I was wondering if there's a, an opportunity for uh, replacement of trees and if there's, you know, barriers that people may have against uh, replacing. Maybe there's certain types of trees that might promote uh, health um, in certain scenarios better than others. And so maybe replacing a tree um, that, that people may already have. Have you given that much thought or, or what are your ideas there? Yeah, I know I, I can't, survival rates vary in terms of what trees are planted and actually make it, you know, it's five years or whatever the interval is. Uh, it's lower than, than you might think in some cases, especially where continuing maintenance and support is not provided. In those cases, yeah, I think it would absolutely be feasible rather than trying to seek out new ground and new trees to plant, to go back and tend to those that, you know, might've perished or might need to be replaced uh, for some reason. Uh, the problem is in a lot of those cases, at least anecdotally that I've heard of, once somebody's had a dead tree on their property for three years, the last thing they want is another tree to replace it. <laughs> this one's just going to die too, might be the reaction. Uh, and it may be soil issues or other, you know, other ecosystem level factors that impact that. Um, so I think, you know, it's certainly something to think about. It really speaks to the value of ongoing maintenance and support early in the process so you don't end up in a situation like that. Uh, but it is it is something that both residents and organizations have to consider. Thank you. Thanks, Lincoln. I think you make a really important point about not planting a tree and walking away, but giving community members support and caring for it. Have you seen good examples of cities or organizations doing this in this work? There are more bad examples and good examples that, <laughs> that I'm aware of. There are community tree stewardship programs in different cities that don't just plant a tree in a public right of way, say like a sidewalk in New York City and say, hey, it's now your tree, make sure you water it. They provide resources and other tools to help the residents kind of understand what tree care looks like in that context. But even then it becomes a challenge. And some of the studies suggest that that's, that's not enough for people that don't have forestry degrees and aren't horticulturalists you know, is, is their day job. Uh, it's a lot to take on that responsibility. And so low maintenance trees are certainly a, a plus uh, considering that. Uh, I, I don't, I'm trying to think of really specific good examples and they're escaping my mind right now. I'm sure some exist across the country, but it is something that absolutely has to be emphasized. It's far less glorious than getting a big grant to plant a ton of trees, right? <laughs> to just revisit and care for the ones you already have. But it's probably more important, both from an ecological standpoint, but also from a relationship building standpoint with some of these residents who could become fantastic environmental stewards if given the right opportunity and tools to do so. Wonderful. It has, oh, go ahead, Lauren. Uh, I Sorry to interrupt, I was just going to say, we don't have any questions from Facebook Live. So Natasha, if you would like to wrap us up here, that would be amazing. I, if I could interject, um, sorry, this is Alex. I'm just calling in from the road. Um, I do have a question. I, the, the recreational benefit of trees is sort of an interesting uh, reason to consider for me. I mean, I don't, I don't normally look at trees and, and think that that's a, a major incentive um, for, for having them. But, but then again, sometimes I do. And it's usually when I like, when I want to hang my hammock or, you know, I see some kids playing in a tree house or something like that. Do you think there's any way to increase interest in trees by kind of promoting, promoting the uh, recreational use of them? For, for organizations that are having difficulty getting, um, you know, buy-in from, from residents? 
Yeah, absolutely. I love your examples because uh, among our many pandemic purchases were in our backyard were zip line for our kids. And then one of those monkey courses is dangling between trees, trees as well. Yeah. So trees are serving a very important role in our backyard, especially during the pandemic as we need things to do. Um, yes, is the answer to your question. I think recreation is one of many ways that we can reframe the value of trees so that individuals can see it for themselves. You know, it's hard to talk about health benefits on a landscape because a lot of time our reaction as humans is going to be, what does that do for me? And that's a natural reaction. And it's the same way about trees. You know, we talk about these broader ecosystem services that trees and other green space provide. But if the residents just seeing the, the negative stuff, you know, the leaves they got to rake or blow or the, uh, you know, the tree limb that fell on their carport or whatever the heck it is, that's all they're going to remember. And so you have to contextualize some of these things in a way that resonates with residents. And to do that, it can't, you, you got to counter the dominant narrative that I, I say that because having a forestry background, I've been in this space, we talk about the benefits of trees all the time. And we feel like everybody fully understands that. And I think even in the green heart space with trees and health, that's become such a big part of the narrative that everybody recognizes that. But we have to remember that a lot of people don't who are outside of those circles. And so we have to understand their narratives in order to be part of their story. And listening is a big part of that. And that's one of the reasons our project is taking the approach we are, is to, is to get uh, that full integration that gives community voices as part of the process. So I guess to that end, like, I mean, I could see, um, you know, potentially in, encouraging uh, buy-in from reluctant um, residents by, Promoting recreation, I mean, like giving giving out instead of giving out rakes, uh, give out hammocks, um, you know, to to the the folks who do have mature trees that are neighbors to the ones that are reluctant. <laughs> um, I don't know if there's really if, it, if it's realistic to influence the narratives, um, but you know, instead of t-shirts, sometimes like if it if it, instead we're you know trying to um, bring to the forefront the interaction of, of people with trees to the mind of those who otherwise kind of don't realize it is, a, is, is something that, you know, maybe they can enjoy down the line. Yeah, no, I think, I think you're absolutely right. It's a nice way of thinking creative, creatively about this. I mean, I will say, you know, the, the pandemic has brought us a lot of challenges <laughs> to be sure, but also some unique opportunities. And one of those is the the spotlight that's been placed on the health benefits that nature can provide. And a lot of my research has focused on that during the pandemic, you know, the way that outdoor recreation can help with mental health specifically uh, in a variety of ways for different populations from kids to college students to, to adults. And so we have this kind of unique window where people are starting to acknowledge and realize those connections for the first time. And anything that we can do to capitalize them, capitalize on them is gonna help us in the long term achieve not just our urban greening goals, but also our public health goals. And I'm really excited and optimistic about those possibilities. It has been fascinating to have this conversation with you. I am sure we could probably talk to you for the rest of the day, <laughs> um, but we, we want to, to honor your time. Um, but I, I did have one more question for you. Um, I love the quote that you shared about uh, this work being more successful when we work with communities and um, not direct work to communities. I, th I thought that was a pretty profound quote. Something that you shared, I think, is um, not discussed as much as it should be, but is um, something that should be discussed more in scientific circles uh, like this, and certainly beyond this circle as a awesome intervention opportunity um, with respect to advocacy and, and discussing research as uh, storytelling. And you shared that as a, a powerful opportunity. Um, can you share some example or where we could even learn more about being better storytellers? Yeah, I mean, that ultimately our, our medium for communication is humans. You know, we talk about social media and all these mechanisms. It's stories. It's always been stories. <laughs> we just share them in different ways, but they're still stories, whether it's door to door or sitting there on the front porch or on TikTok or whatever your preferred media might, might be. And I think, you know, it, it doesn't really matter 
how we tell them, it's that we do tell them. And perhaps more importantly, that we listen to other people's stories. And in my own research, I've used a variety of, of tactics to do this from obvious ones like one-on-one -on -one interviews uh, to maybe less obvious ones like drawing for kids, you know, draw, draw where you, a place where you play every day and see what, what that elicits or photo voice photography projects where you give people and communities a camera, you know, take a picture of why your community is important to you. And maybe they take pictures of trees, which would be great from a Greenheart perspective, right? But maybe they don't, and maybe it has nothing to do with trees. But if they're explaining, you know, provide a caption for your photo while you took it, you can learn more about where they're coming from and what they value. And chances are, once you dig into those stories and you start sharing each other's stories, there's gonna be more, common ground than you realize. And that's the beauty of, of storytelling, this common bond that we as humans have. And I don't mean to get all philosophical and like metaphysical on it, but it really works. And I think that's something that we that can, it can bring us all together if we take just kind of a different approach to these problems and the way we try to address them. Uh, that is <clears throat> beautiful to end this conversation on. We are so grateful for you taking time to have this discussion with us today, Dr. Larson. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you for your uh, amazing body of work um, at the intersections of human, uh, sorry, humans and nature and environmental justice. We can't wait to hear what more you uncover uh, through the Green Heart Project, and we hope that you will join us again soon for um, continued conversation. Yeah, Thank I'd love so to. <laughs> Thanks for your support. And uh, if anybody has questions, feel free to follow up. I hope we get a chance to do this again. Wonderful. Absolutely. Thank you. And we'll turn it over now to Lauren, who is going to share with us some updates on COVID in Louisville through our wastewater analysis. Wonderful. Thank you, Natasha. I am also going to share my screen so I can share two important updates. So the first is that on January 25th, um, WFPL, uh, thanks to our wastewater reporting, reported that wastewaters looked, looked to be declining. So COVID-19 levels looked to be declining in some of Louisville's wastewater. So as a reminder, the Envirome has been tracking um, the amount of COVID-19 virus in our wastewater since June of 2020. And so we have been monitoring the Omicron surge and we are hopeful that um, we have begun the decline or at least reached the plateau. So the data this week is uh, holding steady to uh, still look to be in decline. We might see some saw toothing as um, things even out over time, but I do believe um, we can be confident in saying the worst of Omicron is most likely behind us. So um, in addition to this update, we are uh, doing a genetic analysis on all of our wastewater samples. And so the update that we saw from um, the 17th about a week ago is about 85% of the COVID virus that's in our sewers is Omicron with less than 5% now um, across the board being Delta. So that uh, Omicron is definitely here and the major strain that we are looking at. And then there's another tab here, I can get to it. And so if you would like to keep up to date on this uh, wastewater work, we have um, put up a dashboard at louisville.edu slash enviro. And so if you just go to the, the COVID tab, you'll be able to find the wastewater dashboard link right there. And so each week we update our wastewater monitoring results. And so over time, you will notice the Delta variant becoming less blue. That shows that the Delta variant is decreasing here in Louisville, although it's still um, measurable across the county. If we scroll down, as uh, the Delta variant map becomes less blue, the Omicron variant map has become a um, showing that the Omicron variant took over as the dominant strain here in Louisville in the past month or so. And we are uh, continuing to monitor variants of concern. And so these are just a handful of the hundreds of variants that we are looking at and continuing to monitor. 
So I know that there's red here in this chart, uh, but there's no cause for concern. And uh, these are very low uh, amounts of these variants of concern, but uh, we will be some of the first to know here in our city if there is uh, something happening that we need to be paying close attention. And so I do need to thank uh, the Rockefeller Foundation for their support in this work. Um, and one of the things that we can all do to uh, move ourselves through this pandemic just a bit faster is to uh, make sure that we are all vaccinated. And because we are seeing that the places of highest risk in Louisville are those places that have the lowest vaccination rates. So case rates um, are higher often in the areas where vaccine rates are lowest. And that's also where we're seeing the highest amount of COVID-19 in our sewers. So, uh, you know, we are also in close partnership with Louisville Metro Department of Public Health. And I'm so thrilled to share that they are finding this work helpful and useful. And an example is last week, we started some new statistical analysis that allowed us to identify where testing gaps in Louisville could be so we could make some smarter decisions about where to send our city's resources. So um, I'm just so excited that we get to participate in Louisville's pandemic response this way and help our decision makers make good choices about uh, Louisville's resources. And with that, that's our COVID update for this month. And I will uh, pass the baton over to Dr. Hellman to share about a few upcoming events. Thank you, Lauren. Yeah, that's uh, really important information. And, you know, segueing, we have a, thankfully, an outdoor in-person event uh, coming up. It's a COVID-19 learning event with Dr. Mark Burns at the Coles Event Space. Uh, which is located at the intersection of 29th Street and West Kentucky Street. That'll be held on Tuesday, February 8th. Uh, if you pref and that's from 6 to 7 p.m. And if, if you don't feel comfortable meeting in person, we also have a online or Zoom uh, event uh, for the Greenheart Community Conversation with our very own Dr. Natasha Dijarnet. That's also on February 8th um, at 6, uh, 6 p.m. Uh, and there's the Zoom link there at the bottom of the uh, flyer. Um, and so those are two upcoming events that we have taking place. Um, and so with that, I would like to thank uh, everyone for joining us with our, for our science communication office hour. Uh, special thanks to Dr. Lincoln Larson, obviously, for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Lincoln. And also thank you to our uh, communications team, uh, Lauren Anderson and Drs. Carl and Desjardins. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us either by leaving a comment on this video uh, or by reaching out to us at the environmentinstitute.org. Additionally, uh, you can email us at environm at louisville.edu or follow us on Twitter at U of L Envirome. And so with that, we'll conclude uh, our office hours and we look forward to seeing everyone next time. Thanks again, Lincoln. Take care.